will take a whirlwind tour of John chapter 3. We'll probably, uh, probably be best to read quite a bit of this. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, uh, unto thee Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, You must be born again. The wind bloweth where it willeth, and thou hearest the sound of it, canst not tell from where it cometh and where it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a teacher? of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that which we know, we do know, and testify to that which we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up into heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. <clears throat> and we'll stop right there. Pretty much discuss the situation of Nicodemus and uh, you know Nicodemus was a man was a was a Pharisee was one of the uh, religious leaders by virtue of being a Pharisee he was it says a ruler of the Jews which is different than being a religious leader he was a ruler also and apparently uh, he believed something about Jesus. You know, apparently he had some uh, drawing or some beliefs or some level of commitment, and he came to Jesus. It does happen to say he came by night, so that nobody would spot that he's hanging out with Jesus, which you shouldn't do, you know, I mean, go to church, you know, be part of the religious system, but don't hang out with Jesus, it's not, it's not good for your reputation, you know, and so, but he came, and he came as one who is a teacher, and one who knows and to start things off real well with Jesus, he said, you know, rabbi, which is a term meaning master or great teacher. We know that you're a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles except God be with him. 
Jesus didn't even address that, but the truth is, in the last days, Satan will be doing miracles, his, prophet, his false prophet. And in fact, it says that many will be deceived by reason of the miracles. That will actually be a point because they will think, well, we know you've got to be of God because you couldn't do these miracles. Jesus shut that thing right down. He didn't even answer that issue. He says, look here, here's the deal. Jesus answered. See, this Jesus answered and said unto him, truly, truly, I say unto you, and let, accept, accept, accept a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And later on he says, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Enter or see. And, you know, here Nicodemus is saying, oh, you know, we know that you're of God's kingdom because God's with you and uses you. And he goes, look, until you're born again, you don't even see. You can't see. I don't care what you know or what information that you have. You don't really see and you don't really know. Um, and so it's not... No, go see the kingdom. Or go see the kingdom. Or come see the kingdom. But it was accept. Accept a man be born again. You cannot see the kingdom of God. So there's no need talking about the kingdom or talking about seeing until the person is born again. Um, most of you here, did you ever know, uh, I would say at least probably half of you for sure, if not most, uh, maybe your situation was similar to mine. I had no taste for the things of God before I got born again. I, you know, I mean, the last place on earth I wanted to hang out was a church. Okay. It didn't interest me. Uh, I didn't like pews, and I didn't like preachers, and I didn't like... Christian talk. Uh, I didn't like it at all. I was very much opposed to it. And um, following uh, Christianity, of course, I didn't know Christ, uh, so I, to me it was following Christianity, was certainly, in my estimation, the last thing on my list that I would be doing. <laughs> and that is, without a doubt, the truth. I mean, I remember um, I lived a pretty full life for my 20 some odd years before I came to Jesus. I'd traveled uh, extensively. I had been in and out of the service. I had um, played musically in a lot of different places. I had done a lot of things. And in doing those things, I tried good. I joined good groups and I joined bad groups, and I, you know, I was looking for something. And the more I tried, the more I checked everything off. And I remember finally coming down to Jesus, just about the last thing on my list, you know. But what is it that makes all the difference in a life? What is it that brings the change? And we say, we use the terminology born again, you know. Well, you get born again. Um, and that's right. I mean, there is, no, there is no other way. But what is that? I mean, first and foremost, before any theology or anything else, it is just flat an encounter with the living God, the real, the supreme being of the universe, the living God. It is a genuine encounter by a human, by a man or woman who meets, we can term, almighty God. Now, I know a lot of Christians, but I really, really have some question about how many have met Almighty God. 
And every example I can find in the Scripture, when somebody really, really meets Almighty God, from the biblical account, their whole life and direction changes. It changes. Um, but, however, there are a lot of people who meet religion who change too. I mean, I know that for a fact. A lot of people who've met religion, and they change, you know. They used to go to bars and sing body songs, you know, and now they go to church and sing praise songs. And they get the same exhilaration that they had before. You know, I like sitting around singing with people. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, uh, they've, uh, there've been changes. But to me, the question is, is the change Christ? Is the change Christ? Anybody that gets saved, and I'll use that over and above new birth right now, being born again, anybody who gets saved automatically begins to work on the changes. That is automatic. I mean, they do that whether God ever spoke anything to them to do that. They'll do that. Because... By most people, Christianity has been presented as changing certain things. And you could almost name it all, write it on the board there. Uh, you don't cuss anymore, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't chew, and you don't run with the women that do. You know? And that's kind of the basic, you know, I mean, format there. And, uh, you know, uh, but. But I'm convinced, especially, you know, be, I could really jump ahead up here to John 15, but I'm not going to, that fruit is something that happens way later, that union takes place for a long time. After you're grafted in, there's a long time of, first of all, just getting a connection. And second of all, while the connection is taking place, getting the life that is in him flowing in you. Now, now that's, that's what I call new birth. New birth, you know. Um, Nicodemus said, um, his, his reply to Jesus, he said, you must be born again. When he hears the words, again, it means, how am I going to go back into my mother's womb and me come out again? And Jesus is going, no, no, no. We don't need more of you. We don't need you again. Okay. You messed it up the first time, and you again will only mess it up again. You must be born. There must be a new birth, a new birth. A new birth. Um, first, uh, first Peter 1.23 talks about that. It says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, which if it's incorruptible, that couldn't possibly be you because you are corruptible. I am corruptible, but he is not. His nature is not corruptible. He was tempted in all points like an end of us, but without sin. He is not corruptible. He is not. I find that to be good news. Because for if I look at you or I look at me, I see the potential for messing up, perverting, or destroying anything and everything if, we, if you give us control long enough. So, you know, to me, to me, now you can understand, to me, it's good news. If he is not corruptible, that means there's hope for the human race if the new birth is Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's hope for the human race if 
but only and except a man be born again. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, then, then we have to go on the definition of being born again. Is that what we call a salvation experience? <clears throat> well, yes and no. A salvation experience can simply be somebody who you share with them. A person came 2,000 years ago, let us tack the name Jesus on him, and he died on two sticks of wood, very thick so it could hold him, and he died for your sins. Do you believe that? I believe that. You're saved. Okay. Now, that's not new birth. That's not being born again. And anybody can say, well, you know, I don't want to go to hell. If I say yes, does this mean I don't go to hell? Yeah, it does. Okay, yes. Okay, be in church next Sunday. They show up maybe once, twice, and then they have no taste for it. They have no taste for it. There's no need in talking about chapter 4 about the water or chapter 5 or chapter 6 about eating his flesh there's no taste for it you gotta be born again out of chapter 3 you must be born again you must you must be born again alright <clears throat> well let's say that a person is born again meaning that they have seen, and, and, and for me, and I don't, I, and this is an experience, and you shouldn't judge your experience on, on my experiences, but for me, I saw the need, not just a Savior to keep me from hell, but I genuinely felt within my being, and I remember this so distinctly, that the, the, 20 some odd years I had hold of the steering wheel of my life I had run over people I had plowed through people's lives I had swerved accidentally and taken a few kids out I had you know what I mean I had I had basically was not a very good driver and was not happy with the results of my ability to, take, to, to guide my own life. Now that's what was working in me. I was not happy with many things that were working very deep on me because um, one of the things that had struck deeply was about a year before that, I guess. I don't know exactly how, how much. Maybe it wasn't even a year. Uh, my apartment got raided, my garage apartment behind my parents' house, and about six or seven narcs swarmed the place, and came in, and found all my drugs. No, didn't find all my drugs, found half my drugs. And I got busted, and it was a felony back then. Well, I guess it's a felony this today to have that much drugs. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and, uh, they handcuffed me and were taking me out the front door and as I stepped out, my mom come rushing up from the house and stood there and I looked in her face and she looked in mine and I looked at, as she said, what are you doing? And they said, we're taking him away to jail for a long time. And I remember the look on her face. And something hit me real deep that, uh, you know, this wasn't just a little mistake that I made, that I was hurting people along the way. And that was one of many things that had an indelible thing. Now that, and once again, I'm just telling you my experience. Your experience may not be my experience. I'm just telling you my experience. Don't measure anything by mine. I'm just telling you my experience. But that plus many others that I could tell you about had so worked in me that I was convinced that I needed I 
needed. I don't know. I, I really didn't believe I needed an overhaul. Somehow, because I had gone with up with people for years, the goody good group and everything got in there and perverted them, you know. You know, and they wonder why it was so perverted by the time I got there. I mean, by the time they got there, it was because it was nice when I entered. Uh, they, a lot of religious people, a lot of stuff like that. In fact, most of the people were very, very good people. And I was a very bad person in a very good group. And I did a lot of very bad things and got away with it. Um... And so I, I really didn't believe that I needed help. I didn't, I wasn't looking for a helper. <laughs> I wasn't looking for somebody, an assistant. I wasn't looking for a co-pilot. <laughs> You've seen the bumpers there. Jesus is my co-pilot. Oh, my uh, and maybe that's okay for you. Maybe you don't need, you know, but if Jesus was ever my co-pilot, you better get as far away from me as you can because as long as I have any access <laughs> to that steering wheel out of my nature and abilities, we're in trouble. But I, through a series of things, started reading the Bible, read the whole New Testament through up to the book of Revelation. Jerry told me not to read the book of Revelation. You don't even remember that. You told me, don't read that last book. You don't even remember that, I'm sure. He said, don't read that last book. Don't read it. And God probably used that because I got saved just before I read Revelation. Then read it and went, Phew. Um... <clears throat> But for me, an understanding of salvation or new birth was an understanding that somehow I was going to turn over the direction of my life to Jesus. That was my understanding. <laughs> Not that I was going to keep my life and I'm going to live for God somehow. Because I really, even then, at the very beginning, knew that I couldn't do that. And there had even been experiences prior to that where I almost got saved when they said, and do the best you can or something. I just went, forget it. You know. Because I knew that I knew that I knew I, that I could, you know, doing the best I can wasn't going to hack it. Da -da 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 -da, and I met Jesus. And I met him as one who, and I, you know, Paul said this when he met the Lord, when he, when he had an encounter with the real thing, the one, the ultimate, the, you know, boom to the ground, Lord, what would thou have me to do? There wasn't no, well, you know, you heal? You know, you're going to bless me? You're going to help me? It was... Lord, I'm yours. From now on, you're my Lord. Now you tell me what's going on because I don't know. And and Nicodemus is saying, okay, now let me see if I understand you correctly. And you know what? If Jesus hadn't come back and corrected, he may never, he may have gone with his understanding. Me again, in a certain sense, wipe the slate clean. Now, now I believe in wipe the slate clean, but I believe that the new beginning better be Christ. I mean, or you're going to end up messing the slate up and having to keep wiping it clean. I mean, there is, you know what I mean, there is the wonderful truth of the blood that every time you mess up, the blood of Jesus will come and wipe it clean, and if there's no more remembrance on God's part, and then you come and mess it up and... You know, and then, then, you know, you mess it up and then he keeps wiping the slate clean. And there is that wonderful truth and I don't take away from that truth. And, and I know that every one of you at some time or another after continually doing this, going to Jesus, have 
gotten afraid that God was tired of you messing up and doing this and was getting rather short with you. I'm sure, you know, I did. And, and in fact, for a time, I just quit going to the Lord about it because I just messed up so much that I felt like, you know, I don't really have a right to be in the throne room this often, and I'm sure the line is long. I mean, that's the way I felt. You know, I mean, I'm in here all the time, and I'm sure you got like 8 million other or whatever people, uh, you know, and I probably should only be coming in here like once a week, and here this is my 57th time today until the Holy Spirit had to teach me that the blood works every time, all the time, without any uh, pull on God. Jesus already died and paid for them. You know what I mean? The, the pull is gone. You know, it's not like he's going, oh, man. You know what I mean? I mean, it's not like that. I mean, I, I used to think, oh, you know, this is some sort of a drain on him that I'm, you know, or, or he's really, like, getting disappointed. Well, you know, does you say, okay, well, God doesn't like us to sin. No, he doesn't, but I tell you what, he also doesn't like you to sin. Think he's getting really disappointed and leave that on your record. Knowing him, I can tell you that he is more disappointed with those who think he's disappointed and won't take advantage and make void the grace of God. He is more disappointed with those who would he would let his son die and cover all of that and take care of it, and you would ignore that because you think you're disappointing God. Now, that's disappointing because all provision is there. You understand what I'm saying? And we're going, oh, well, you know, I, I mean, he wants you to walk, come boldly to the throne of grace, grace, G-R-A-C-E, find help in time of need. But, thank God, that's not what it's all about. There is a nature that we have received that, if understood correctly what the new birth is, this incorruptible seed will begin to produce, will begin to bring forth. But now we have to explain what that means. Don't. Bring forth. The incorruptible seed will bring forth. Okay. That means that what's going to happen is that I am this um, entity here and I have just met Jesus and I have received the incorruptible seed and because... I am born again, or I have Jesus in there. Jesus is going to come out. And if Jesus comes out, they, there's no sin. But if I come out, there is sin. So the goal is to not go by my soul, but my spirit, and to let Jesus come out of me. Yes. And no. Because when you receive Jesus, this isn't this isn't just and primarily Jesus Christ, the Lord, standing on the inside of you like this. Okay? Just let me live and everything's gonna be garuvi. <laughs> you know? Everything's gonna be cool. No, this is part of understanding what the new birth really is. What the new birth really is. It is incorruptible seed. Seed. It is, like all seeds, if I can say it this way, it is the potential of everything. Everything. So that, you've heard me say this before, but this is how God taught me. I mean, this is how I learned. You know, I use, can I say something to you? Some of you have been around a long time. 
I use certain examples, and you've heard them over and over, and so you're probably getting tired of them by now, because I was with a group seven years with the leader, and after seven years I'd heard all of the examples two or three times, but then seven years it was over. And another church started, and I was with that leader for seven years, and he used his examples, and I got used to them over and over, and then it was over. Well, this church has been going 14, and you're probably getting real tired of my examples. It's not seven years and over, and now you get to go to somebody else's. But I want to tell you something about many of my examples. <clears throat> I use them because I got to know Jesus through them. They were instruments through which I met and, and better know Jesus. They're not just cute little stories. They're not just cute little examples that, well, you know, somebody could say this. Well, Randy, why don't you find some new examples? Well, for the truth that I'm teaching, I don't need a new example. I saw the reality through this example. I've got the reality. Now I'm trying to communicate it. And though the example does not declare that, it doesn't declare it. The Holy Spirit declares it. The example somehow helps you to see it. But others can look at that same example and go, huh? In fact, they could sit and hear me say it over and over and go, huh? Or go, okay, I got it. I got it. You know, I got it. I got it. Oh, good one. I remember that one. I got it. And never know the Lord. Because the new birth is Christ. The new birth is a person. And it is a nature. It is a reality other than the one we've always and forever known. It is not a denomination. It is not the way you thought before you came to Jesus. It is not the stuff people put in your mind when you got saved. It is the second person of the Trinity, the ultimate being of all beings, the reality that long after you and me and our little thoughts and our little denominations and our little nations and our little continents pass away, <laughs> will be and will reign supreme. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Not just words, not just yell. He's big stuff. He's bigger than big stuff. He is what is. And we are not until we have known him, except a man be born again. You can just forget it. And no amount of religion can produce what he produces. Because we are not like him. Now, we can mimic him, and many do. But the task here is not to mimic. The task is to, is to know in an in a intimate way, not just to know intellectually, though through examples, and say I already got off from my example, it brought up all this, but through examples, you may know, and, but what if, what if I used to teach for years out here at Denton State School, and God told me to minister to th those kids. And I said, Lord, they don't even understand what, you know, how to stick a spool on a, you know, a dowel rod. And he said, you don't receive me in your mind or by your mind. You receive me by your spirit. And so I started ministering freely then. I said, you know, and some of them who were trying real hard to go, huh? What are you saying? And I led some of them to the Lord. Led some of them to the Lord. They received Christ. And I know they didn't understand. 
I know their spirits were moved upon by the Holy Spirit and they received Christ. You know? But I also know that our mind and our will, strong-willed, or our emotional tenor or our um, strengths or our whatever, we think adds to our stature in relationship to him. And in reality, you cannot add one cubit to his stature. So to receive him is all stature. But he says, while you can't add one cubit by taking thought, as far as my view towards you, I, I, I'm so aware of you that I have the number of the hairs on your head count. And if I take care of the sparrows, how much more do you think your heavenly Father, this is Jesus talking, and I, you know, I mean, this is Jesus talking. No, you know, that's like Moses, David, and Jesus, right? No. Moses met God. David met God. Jesus said, I am the incarnate. The I am, if you want to understand the Father, here it is. And quit worrying. How can you by worrying add one cubit to his statue? He takes care of the sparrows. How much more will your heavenly father, not the big man upstairs, the big boss or the whatever, but your heavenly father take care of you? All right, well, now, 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 now we're talking that if you have, if you receive something and you don't know what you got, you might even have it, but you don't know what you got. Can you understand that? That a person could actually have, now, now back to my example, it takes me a while, but sometimes, back to my example, God used this to teach me. It was as if he put a seed in my hand. And I mean, God used this. This supreme being, he used this to teach me. He said, Randy, and I don't know if I heard an audible voice or why, I don't remember. All I remember is it was, this is what it, I remember. Randy, look at that seed. What do you see? Little brown thing. He said, no, no. And it was almost like my father pulled me up close to him and says, you need to have your father's eyes. It's almost like he's talking to a dumb kid. What do you see? A little brown thing. You know. Apple seed. Little brown thing. He said, look closer. What do you see? A little brown seed. You know? And he said, no. Let me tell you what I see. And this is what he said to me. I see branches. And I see roots. And I see leaves and stems. I see colors. It was was an apple seed. I see red. I see green. I see browns. He says, I see life flowing. I see... He just went on and on. I'm going, ah! I mean, it just began something in me to help me to see as my father sees. It was, it was an amazing thing that happened because it's just an example. And what I'm breathed onto the Holy Spirit. It's a good example that people go, oh, yay. But to have understood, that's all I only went on to, to go, not just understood what's there, but understood how to see from now on kind of a deal. Like my father. I'm always, I was always, up to that point, I was always flat and, you know, two-dimensional and, and black and white and unable to see and, and narrow. And, 
you know, and that narrow is perfect for the Pharisees. That black and white is perfect for the Pharisees. You can be a great Pharisee being that way. But he is so, I mean, you know, I, I, and I'll never forget. And he said, you know, he says, I see all that, and then I see all these colors. And then he says, and I smell, I smell the apple blossoms, and I smell the apple when it's cut open, and I, and I'm just going, <laughs> ah, how can I get these kind of eyes? And he says, you have them through me. And he said, you receive the seed, incorruptible seed. You got it all. but you don't see it all. The Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 2. All things have been put under his feet and there is not anything that is not put under his feet. So that, da, 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 you know what I mean? And it talks about him being... And then it says, but we see not yet all things under his feet. Now, that's the same as the seed. It is the reality that Jesus is Lord just like the reality of the new birth. It's not just some theology. It, Jesus is Lord. And how many? All. It would have to be all that you ever talk to, especially among spirit-filled circles, would say, oh, I know Jesus is Lord. But if all things are under his feet, then why do we panic so much? Why are we always trying to get something to happen? Why are we... And it's because... We're not really believing that Jesus is Lord. We're fearful that the devil is Lord. We're fearful that we're Lord. We're fe you know what I mean? All kind of things. I mean, there's so many fears. We are full of fears. And, and Jesus, every time he showed up and the disciples hadn't seen him, you know, and that's why he hung with them so much. He just stayed with them all the time. You know what I mean? He just walked with them all the time. Not to keep them from being fearful, but any time he'd take off for a little while and go pray and come back, they'd be afraid. And the first words out of his mouth was, fear not. You know what I mean? I mean, that's all the time. That's the way it is. He, okay, I'm back. I was only gone like half an hour. Fear not. And, it's, and it is true, though. Just like, just like Peter, who Jesus said, fear not, it is I, and he comes walking on the water. Peter looked at Jesus and walked on water when he looked at the storm when he looked at the circumstances when he looked at how bad things looked when he heard the thunder clouds and the waves and he saw and he felt and Jesus said why did you why did you doubt you know you go our, our answer would be I don't know, Lord. I just failed you again. I just hate it, man. I don't know why I do this. I mean, I follow you and I mean well, and then I just mess up. I don't know why. And he's going, that's not the answer I wanted. I wanted, why did you doubt? And for you to say, because I started going by my senses, looking around, feeling, tasting the salt water as it blew into my mouth, watching looking there and I got my eyes off of you as total stability even where stability cannot be walking on water I got my eyes off of you and I got my eyes on circumstances and Jesus would have said now you have learned you're learning he wouldn't have said oh like we say and we want him to say to us oh big failure you've done it again you know he he would want us to to respond so that he can say that he can know he doesn't mind see we're talking long suffering here you know what i mean we're talking god is long suffering and i could give you examples from the scriptures i know would blow your mind blew my mind when i saw them. unbelievable things He's long-suffering. And to, to take little steps is big with him. But to sit down like a child, throw a fit, 
whine, cry, kick, and expect God to, you know, stop, go back. And you know what? He does that, and he does it all the time. He does it for me, and he does it for you, and he will continue to do it. But if we could just catch a glimpse of what this thing is about. And here, the new birth, incorruptible seed, the potential of everything is already there, which is meant to be a point of assurance. A point of assurance. But because we don't see the branches and we don't smell the apple blossoms right now and we don't see the fruit, we can't taste the fruit or whatever, we don't have it. So, you see, there is no faith. Where, where does faith come in, folks? Christ, the incorruptible seed, dwells in your heart by faith. If you're not exercising faith, he's not dwelling there. Now, yes, he is. But once again, the primary thing that God is trying to bring forth is not the person of Christ in you. Jesus left the throne and he's inside of you like this. Okay? If you'll just stop, I'll do all this stuff. It'll never happen that way. He's come into you as a nature. As a nature. As a na Now that's a fact. He has come into you as a nature. You have received his nature. You have become partakers of the divine nature. So, the, so that's being born again. It is a new creation it is man and God God's nature but man very much man very much you when we talk about the death of the old man that was your old nature folks it wasn't you you are still trust me kicking you your personality who you are God is not trying to not make you carry anymore or you know whoever he's not trying to he wants his son in you by his nature. New birth. All right, so that's not, that's not sitting around waiting for, for Jesus to, well, you know, I said, Lord, well, if you're going to do it, then just do it. You know, and kind of... And then... But rather, now the goal is to understand what we have. What we have. The problem in Christianity today is most people are trying to get. And I want to tell you right now, plain and clear why they're trying to get. Because they are trying to get something out here in the outward. A feeling, an action, of something that they can do that will prove that Jesus is there. Proof. In the sense realm, their senses must prove to them the reality of Christ, the ultimate being. Something in the sense realm has to prove. So they're trying to get that's something, whether it's a feeling from God or whether it's a, you know, a, a, an action that they finally take contrary to one that they didn't want. They're trying to get something and they haven't realized what they have. What they have. The incorruptible seed with all. And you can just write that on the inside of that little seed there. All. All. It's got it all. He's got it all. He has got it all. He has. And you have him by his nature dwelling within you. So there is, there is nothing that can keep you from that except Number one, you've got to receive it. Except a man be born again. Because you can't...
produce any of that. Now, if somebody presents it instead of seed form, let's say that they present it in commandment form to this person. You understand? Instead of the seed form, they all is do this and do that and do this, you know. I always liked it after I got saved and received Jesus. I read the Ten Commandments totally different. It says, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not. And you know, by Christ you won't. I guarantee it. If it's his nature, you won't. There's no doubt about it. Thou shalt not. It's not thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. You know? And it, you just go, whoa. Thou shalt. Love thy neighbors, that's that. You know? But it's not going to happen off of this book. It's going to happen out of the seed within but if somebody presents that seed, the all of that seed in commandment form, then you're going to have to work real hard because it's not a nature. In fact, your nature is contrary to this. And you are doomed, doomed, doomed. Except the man be born again of incorruptible seed. He must be born again. And then, one of the biggies about being born again is from then on, because you can't even see the kingdom of God. You can't even enter. So new birth is stepping into a kingdom, into a reality, into another realm that has nothing to do with the way anything you knew before. <laughs> the way you thought before. Can I tell you something? The way you thought before is called the natural mind that when applied to God's things is called the carnal mind and it is an enemy of God. Enemy. Not his friend. It's his enemy. You know, well, I, I've got it put together really. Uh, you know, until... You see, he says he wants to come in by his spirit and renew our mind to renew our mind to the way he thinks. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, what is he talking about? He says, well, let me describe this mind to you so that you can understand what's going to happen to you when you get renewed in this mind. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he laid down his life and he became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. He became as a man, then he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And he begins to describe this one who doesn't, sit around and go, now i got my rights and i got what belongs to me and I know what I should get and that's not fair and this isn't right and that's not the way it should be. That is totally contrary to this nature. It is totally self-exalting and Jesus' spirit is self-sacrificing it is the opposite of God. It is the op I'm talking about the opposite of God. I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, you're a bad person. I'm just saying you're the opposite of God. Or I'm the opposite of God. You'd rather not be called a bad person. You're not a bad person. You're just the opposite of God in nature. You don't look like his child. You don't act like his child. You don't respond like his child because you don't think like his child. Because you have not been renewed, your mind has not been renewed, and so something comes your way, and boom, it hits right there in your mind. And then boom, your emotions respond to it. And then boom, you go through all this turmoil and all this stuff, and maybe after three or four days, the Holy Spirit can come upon you and at least calm you down. Maybe not even have anything to do with bringing this out, just, just the fact of preaching and being, or getting over it or your emotions run wild long enough and you just get over it. <laughs> but the real deal is that when things are going bad or not going bad, he, he doesn't care about the timing of circumstances in that sense, but if they're not going bad, he's got one objective and that is for you to begin to understand, like Jesus said to Nicodemus, hey, you're a ruler, you're a religious leader, you being such a one, 
Don't you know these things? I mean, what do you what are you teaching the people? <laughs> what are you communicating as truth? Because if this isn't it, except this be it. I don't know what you're talking about. It may sound like what I've been talking about. But it cannot produce life. It cannot. It cannot. It cannot. There's no way. There's no way. None. Except a man be born again. So it is possible to be born again and not know or see, you know, see the kingdom. Okay, well, when you see the kingdom, what are you going to see? You're going to see the king. And what's a king usually do? He rules or governs. What will he govern in you? You have lords and kings in you. Your mind, your will, your emotion are all given government. Did you know that? They are given government in you, but they're not the ultimate, not meant to be the ultimate government, but there are kings within you. Your bodily demands and desires but they are to be reigned over by the king of kings. But, see, we, we have presented the gospel. If you took all this away, if you take all this away, we have presented the gospel as simply a person that is headed for hell. Uh, I guess we should put hell down, huh? hell, but if you believe certain things, then you will go to heaven, and basically, you've added two things together, the way you were before you knew Jesus, with some beliefs. You know, and this is where you get carnal Christianity. <laughs> this is where you get all the junk. This is where, you know, now, I believe if we receive Christ that we will go to heaven. I believe that if we believe the work of God, we'll go to heaven. But this is where it departs from God's real plan, and God's real plan is that this person not just go to heaven, because this would be very disappointing to God if he's saved on the planet, you know, 800 billion people who only believe that if they believe something about something that happened 2,000 years ago, then they'll go to heaven. And heaven is going to be populated with self-centered, self-serving babies that are nothing like their father. Does anybody agree with that? Can you see how that would happen? Is that what he wants? You know. And I say no. I say... You, you must be born again. Let's lead them to the Lord. But then we must tell them the truth. Jesus is the way. That's the way to the Father. Okay, but he's also the truth, and ultimately he becomes the life. He is not just the way. And that's our, our task. But the task, but, but to see if we will take up the task. The Father gives us a challenge first to see if we'll take up the task. He gives a challenge, and he says, okay, you get born again and walk the way and know the truth and yield to the life. Become a living epistle. Know the truth not, not in your head so that you could preach this message at the drop of a hat, but know the truth in such a manner that when, when people looked at Jesus, Philip said something about it, and Jesus said, Philip, have I been so long with you and yet you still don't know? Oh, yeah, I know a lot of stuff. You've been teaching stuff for three and a half years here. I know. What do you want to talk about? that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Mm. 
No, he didn't know that. And yet, that is the goal, not... You know, have I been so long with you and you don't know the seven primary doctrines of... Do you know what I mean? Or the... I mean, he goes, have you not known me? Do you not know... Don't you... Don't you know what's happening here? This is the Father. And then Paul comes along and says the same thing in relationship to Christ. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. That's, he didn't say, not me in hell, but me in heaven because Jesus died for me. He said, not I, but Christ liveth in me. But it's not some sort of weird concept of Jesus in there that's going to come out of me one day when I have a revelation that is going to make the person of Christ. It is... The reality, you have to, the key is you have to know the Jesus that you have received. And you have received Christ in his nature, and you have to understand his nature before you could ever yield to it. You have to understand that nature. And it's easy, and I want to say this, it is easy to yield to that nature when you understand it. It is hard when you ain't got a clue what you're supposed to do. But if you're in a situation... That, and you know that Christ is your life because you understand. You've seen the real deal about the cross and that wasn't just that he shed his blood, but I am dead, and you really understand that. Maybe you don't. But when you do, you will. It's funny how, you know, when the sun comes up, you will see. You know, I mean, uh, it's just kind of funny how that works. When you understand what took place, and you really, and you not, not you studied it, and you've heard, you listened to the tapes, or you did this and that. I mean, you know. And he said he will reward those who diligently seek him, but he doesn't reward half-hearted, lukewarm, slipshod, fence-riding Christianity. He doesn't reward that. He doesn't. He never will, because they're at their time, their convenience, when it seems right for them, when their feelings are right. They go after God, and he do, he can't, he, it, would, it would be against everything that he is to reward that. But for a true diligent seeker, he will, when he's tired, press in. And when he's not hungry, he will open the word and go, I'm not hungry, but I, all I know is I need you, Lord. You will find him saying things that you won't find the normal person saying. You will. You'll find it or her. You'll find him saying, man, I hate this. I'm not hungry, but this is where I need to be, and I need feeding, and I need to know you, and I don't know you, and it's obvious to me I don't know you. It's not, it's, you don't deceive yourself and go, oh, I know him. I'm okay. And this is what most of us do. We get a little shaky in some circumstance, and so we go to the Word, and we go to the Lord, and we get just enough to feel better about ourselves so that we can go back out again. That's what we do instead of pressing in to know the Lord and to go, man, I, I've just got one task in my life, really, and I've got to know you, Lord. I've got to know you. I've got to know the cross. If this is indeed the crux of all things, then it is very foolish for me to be messing around. I know what my task is. And you can say that, and you can say it a bunch. And people say, yeah, I know. At, at that moment, the Holy Spirit always moves. And so you go, because he, you know, he loves to lift, he wants to lift up Jesus. He wants to reveal the cross. I mean, it's his total, that's why he came back. That's why the Holy Spirit was sent, I mean. That's why he came. So he's going to fall on that, you know what I mean? I mean, you start talking that way, and he's just going to fall on it. And, of course, we're going to go, oh, because we're going to know that's his heart because we are born again. So he can touch us. But because we have not known and we won't press beyond our own comfort zones, we will revert back, you know, and it's not the best example, but, you know, the, the swine is turned back to the mire and the dog to his vomit. I mean, we do. You do. I do. I'm not, you know, I mean, this, I am no different than anybody else. It is the truth for all of us. Christ is the answer. There is nobody. There's none righteous. No, not one. Not one. And I know that, and I don't, don't think because I preach this, that I think something that I don't think, because I don't. I know what it takes for me to know the Lord. And I know the willingness on God's part for him to reveal his son, and so I will continue. I will continue. 
and I will press when it's not convenient. Not, not in some sort of an attitude that God will reward me for my works because I pressed, because I fasted, because I prayed, but because I just want to know him and he will see one that wants to know him for him and he knows that he can reveal himself to that person. You know, the crowds chased after Jesus, but Jesus hid himself because he knew what was in all men. He would not... Remember those scriptures? You know, he goes, hey, you know, sorry. You know, they wanted to make him king, and he went and hid himself. I know what kind of king you want. You know, and then he starts preaching the cross, and they go, huh? Why are you talking about self-giving, man? You're it. You're the big one. You're the answer to all my flesh. You're everything my flesh could ever want. You feed out of nothing, out of a few loaves and fishes. Every time we get sick, you heal. You're, you're blessing. I mean, you're always sharing the word, and we feel up and good all the time. And, man, I mean, they're just, you know, demons getting away. We just cast them out. I mean, you're it. This is the life. He said, I'm going to go to the cross. Huh? Don't be talking that way. Don't you be talking that way now. That mess up all of our plans. We got big plans here. I can see how you could really benefit my flesh. And so when he did do what he said he did, was going to do, he went to the cross and died, they all went into confusion and went running off and going, ah. But he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And he, he was who he was. And, and I want you to know this. If you're in the Word, the Word declares that Jesus. And if the Word gets in you, and if the life is in you, and you get the Word here in the, in the, in the mind, and, you, and its seed is in you, then there is only one way you will act. When you are cursed, you will bless. You won't, have, you won't do it because of command or duty. You will do it because you know it is His nature to. You will feel like cursing because it is your soul to do that. But you will not. You don't have to. You just understand who your life is and you let this mind. It's not a work, it is a letter. You let this mind be in you. You let it. You don't resist it. You don't go, ah, I don't know how to do that. You say, Christ is in me and he will do it and I will bless right now. And if it takes you five minutes to get it together or five hours or five weeks, eventually, somewhere, Christ is going to come out. Not just you'll get over it. Not just the fever will run its course. Not, you understand what I'm saying? Not just that it just kind of passes away and, the, you know, you're not as upset as you were before because, well, what's the use of getting mad? You know, that's a good answer. It's not Christ, but, well, what's the use of getting mad? Or what's the point? I mean, what's the point if I go gouge their eyes out? You know, I'll just end up in jail. So I'm, I'm going to get over this. Well, that's great. Good. You didn't release the murderous spirit within you. But that's what's basically your government. Whereas the other way, if it's five months, if it's five years sometime, let this mind be in you. You know what I'm saying? You say, well, I want it to be in five minutes. If it's not five minutes, if it's five weeks, then it's sometime, let this mind be in you. And if you say, I can't, you are wrong. You are wrong. And it's because you don't understand the cross yet and you don't understand what has taken place. You don't understand. So if you say, I don't understand then, I don't understand then, you know, and that's, you know, we get upset with this kind of preaching. 